our uh, next lesson. We're looking at, for ESS, and we're looking at topic 3.2, the origins of biodiversity. Uh, now we're getting into some evidence for evolution. So we know that evolution is simply change over time. Um, and just to recap, we know about how evolution works now, uh, and that's following the theory of natural selection, uh, which Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace were responsible for coming up with. Uh, in 1859, um, and that famous book of Charles Darwin's on the origin of species helped us understand uh, a lot more about how evolution takes place. So what we're going to do during this quick uh, lesson, I'll go through, through some notes um, on some key bits that, of evidence that actually show us evolution taking place out there. Um, so what is evolution? Uh, well, it's just uh, small changes over time, essentially. And how does it work? Natural selection is the best theory that we have right now. Um, and we have a lot of evidence to support the theory of natural selection. So if people want to debate evolution with you, say, no, the, the, that's the what. The what is there. We know things change over time. The how is the fun bit to talk about. And that's natural selection. So the theory of natural selection is where people should be having their discussions, okay? Um, and we'll get into, I'm just gonna be flipping through a little bit of my notes. Some of these will be videos that we would have in class and I'll leave those up for a second when I get to a video um, and you can do some searching on it. I'll put the links in the descriptions as well. So there's lots of evidence for evolution. And it's just, there's more and more and more evidence out there. We're, all, we're only gonna focus uh, right now in this video on the first three pieces to this puzzle. Um, their DNA has actually crushed it in terms of really showing us definitive links in our DNA to other species, uh, links in those species um, by looking at the the repetitions of those A's, T's, G's, and C's in our DNA. Uh, we could really get into that as well, but that's probably for another lesson, or another unit all to itself. Um, so diving into this first one, we, we'll look at the fossil record. This is a really uh, nice tangible uh, piece of evidence for evolution because you can see and touch it and feel it. Uh, this, in this example here, this is something, I'm gonna move my face out of the way here for a second. Um, this is something known as the Archaeopteryx. Uh, and here's an artist rendition of what the Archaeopteryx would have looked like. And scientists found this fossil in some sandstone. And if you look really carefully, you can see some claws and you can start to see something amazing here. You start to see feathers and feathers and feathers throughout this area. You also see a, a, a humerus, uh, an ulna and a radius bone and some fingers as well. Uh, you can see some vertebrae, a jawline, even some teeth. Now, why is that significant? Well, this actually is what we would call a, a missing link. Um, people were saying, well, who are the ancestors or who, who are the descendants of the dinosaurs? Where did the dinosaurs go? we start to actually see, and now we know that birds are the descendants of, of some of the dinosaurs, um, and the Archaeopteryx provides evidence of that. It starts to, we start to see teeth. We know birds don't have teeth now. Uh, sharp claws and solid bones, um, and you start to see a, a bird-like feature like this. And I'll put a, um, a link in the description to a wonderful BBC uh, documentary that actually talks about Archaeopteryx. Uh, Quite substantially so we can get into that a bit later and I'll provide this one also in the links and this is looking at whales as well as uh, the missing links between uh, current whales and their uh, ancestors now when we look at homologous structures that was next on the list of pieces of evidence for evolution um, the pentadactyl limb, penta for five, uh, and you see the five digits here in each one of these pictures. Pentadactyl limb is a wonderful piece of evidence that shows similarity between species that are so different. And this helps us say, well, this, there really needs to be some kind of 
anyone with a brain can see that there's some kind of connection here. If you go back far enough, there probably is a, a species that links these things. Um, Five-fingered human with an ulna radius. A lizard, of all things, with an ulna radius humerus. Five fingers on a cat. Uh, five fingers on a whale, on a bat, on a frog, on a bird. Next time you eat chicken, and a lot of you out there eat chicken, take the chicken wing, eat it, strip all the, the flesh off until you get to the bones. This is what you'll see. It's quite phenomenal. It's actually an elbow, exactly like the way our elbow works, uh, and rotates and moves as well. Uh, there's been a lot of time, so these fingers have fused here, a little bit like a horse may have fused. Uh, some of the bones in, in larger mammals like um, elephants will have fused together here as well with the ulna and the radius. But you can definitely see that there's that similarity. Homologous structures exist showing us that there's some common ancestor likely between these things. Uh, I'll put a link to this one. There's some evidence looking at um, uh, a nerve that connects the brain to the voice box, yet in a weird way, that nerve actually goes down below our aorta, which is uh, the largest vessel in our heart, and comes back up to power the nerve. So why does it go from our brain all the way down to our heart and come back up? Seems like quite a silly design. If you're a designer, you don't make that mistake. Um, however, evolution can show, long story short, in this one, we look at a giraffe, um, and Richard Dawkins walks us through this, and evolution will show that we inevitably evolve from the ocean, from fish, and the direct line from the brain to the voice box was very short. As you develop a neck, you move longer and longer, but that nerve still wraps around the heart, and you can't rewire that. So once it's there, it's there, so you just have to evolve, stretch it out, and change over time um, without completely redesigning it little bit of evidence for evolution and not design, not direct purposeful design. Nature is selecting again. Um, there's another piece if you want to see evolution in action. There's an interesting video on, um, on this, if, if, on vestigial organs, and here's a vestigial muscle that we still have, which means we don't need it anymore. It was for climbing in trees, but some people still have it. Um, pretty interesting to, to try to explore. And the last piece that we'll look at uh, is artificial selection as evidence for evolution. Um, we see this every single day. Just look at people walking their dogs. Um, technically, dogs are all still the same species, and they've come from wolves. And, but we see all the different types of dogs out there. In a way, we are speciating dogs. We are artificially selecting for traits that we want. We are playing nature in this case and we are selecting the traits we want and isolating them and making them breed with other things like corgis with corgis with corgis with corgis and you'll get a purebred corgi. Um, corgi and German Shepherd, I don't know if someone's done that or not, but you can select traits that you would like. I interesting to see that with corn. Uh, corn initially was a small plant like wheat, then started to grow up into plants like this in nature. We have selected the, um, the recessive traits of corn uh, it's yellow, which is not natural. It, it shouldn't be um, homogenous like this in color in nature. Uh, this would get devoured by animals and would not survive to reproduce in nature. Yet it's sweeter and it's softer and it's yellow. It's a color that we like. So we have mass produced this corn um, artificially and we are artificially selecting this. And if we keep going, we might create a new species of corn based on this and new species of dogs based on this. So it's again, evidence that you, nature, in this case us, can drive these changes over time. And changes over time um, to an entire population, well, that's evolution. Great video that I'll post here is on selective breeding. It's very interesting um, on designer cats. So if you're a cat person, watch that. If you're uh, not a cat person, stay away. Um, and couple more examples that we can look at uh, of evidence for, uh, for natural selection leading to evolution. Uh, we see that here with the classic example of the peppered moths. 
um, the story of the pepper moths during uh, the Industrial Revolution. You had uh, a, uh, a lichen growing on trees that gave big white patches on those trees. And moths, peppered moths, can come in many different colors, many different varieties. Uh, some have a lot more white in them. So if you're a white moth, and you're growing on these healthy trees that have this healthy white lichen on it, well, you disappear. And so who's gonna get eaten? Well, your dark brothers and sisters will get eaten up here. However, during the Industrial Revolution, we had a, a change in coloration. Um, a lot of the pollution killed off the lichen in the background, and the trees became more brown, their natural color behind that lichen. So now, if you have that brown characteristic on a brown tree, you're gonna survive and you're gonna see the white moths actually stand out and get eaten up. So we, you see this subtle change or actually pretty rapid change in terms of um, the moths, the color of the peppered moths surviving out there based on nature. Nature is selecting who survives back to natural selection. And those, again, some more evidence for evolution. If you keep that up for many, many, many generations, you get a complete shift, a speciation and evolution has taken place. Um, another place, another example where we see this happening in the world uh, is with the, the rise of um, elephant poaching. Uh, it's, I lived in Tanzania for 20 years of my life and the last eight years uh, poaching has been rampant, uh, especially in the Salu uh, Reserve, game reserve. And one thing that researchers are finding in Salu, many places actually in Africa where poaching uh, has hammered the elephant population, is we're starting to see things like this over here, tuskless elephants occurring. Um, and tusklessness is actually becoming much more prevalent than it was in the past. Um, why is that? Humans are actually searching out and killing the largest uh, elephants with the largest ivory for the ivory uh, illegal ivory trade and by doing so they're leaving behind um, they're not obviously killing the ones without tusks so those are left to reproduce and you're actually seeing this tuskless gene it is a gene which usually used to be a real disadvantage to have no tusks because uh, the large males use that for fighting and dominance and also uh, the, all elephants use it for digging for minerals and tearing bark off trees to access some water and some nutrient. So if you don't have tusks, it's a disadvantage usually. However, now it's an advantage because you're not being hunted um, and you're not being shot by poachers. So that gene is actually becoming more prevalent. There's lots of examples of this. You can also look at a similar example with uh, malaria and, 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 and sickle cell anemia in Africa. Um, that's a story for another day as well when we get to genetics. Um, so with that, I'll stop. There's a lot of interesting videos to explore. In our next uh, class, what we're going to be doing is actually we're going to be looking at evolution by natural selection, and we're going to be looking at the story of elephants um, and tusklessness in more detail. And you'll be looking uh, to do a case study on this, actually, this big issue of uh, ivory poaching and um, tusklessness. Okay, so for now, I stop here, and we'll continue next time. Oh, where's the stop button? There it is.